All right, uh, welcome to your uh, 524 class factor analysis video. Um, hopefully this won't take several hours. Uh, there are a lot of slides and of course you can break this video up into pieces uh, as you wish. Um, so I will record it as one continuous uh, film, but I will um, allow you, of course, to fast forward and rewind and stop and take breaks uh, wherever you would like uh, because this is the nature of online education. Uh, but in class, there will be plenty of time for us to go through this um, and clarify anything that uh, will be uh, inevitably confusing. Well, no, I shouldn't say inevitably confusing because I'm going to be extremely clear in all of my explanations of these statistics. Statistics everywhere. All right, so uh, today's class is inspired by Dr. Andrew Comrie. This was um, uh, a professor that I had in grad school. Um, I had him as a professor of an entire semester of factor analysis. And as in this picture, you may be able to see the chalkboard behind his head with uh, wildly scribbled um, numbers and charts all over the board. Um, he was uh, approximately 81 years old um, when I was in his class in 2004. And uh, many of you guys know Andy Ainsworth. Andy was also in the class uh, with me. So uh, we learned from this guy. And uh, he was an amazing mind. Uh, we used, in um, uh, 2004, floppy disks were like, you know, out of style, even then, uh, out of style. And he was using them uh, still to uh, illustrate uh, factor analysis along with the chalkboard. He did a lot of things by hand. Um, so he, this was an amazing experience for us. I don't really remember too much of what he actually taught us. Um, but I have been using factor analysis ever since, so um, my methods have adapted from his. Um, so uh, just a few facts on this guy, and uh, who, as far as I know, is still alive. Um, I haven't seen any updates in the last few years on what he's been up to, but, um, but he graduated from college in 1943, served in the Navy, uh, married his wife, whose wife passed away. Uh, there was an article about her uh, in 2010. Uh, so they were married for a mere 65 years. Um, he earned his Ph.D. in 1949, went to Illinois for a couple of years to study under um, uh, one of the other uh, uh, factor analysis uh, famous uh, inventors, as we'll see here in a minute, um, and then uh, came back to California in 1951. And so we had him in 2004, which would have been his 53rd, 54th year of teaching at UCLA and 57th overall. Wow. Published his first paper in 1949, and if you look back at his CV, he published his last paper in 1997. So he's been retired for quite some time. And of course, uh, the point is that he taught Andy and I how to do this stuff in 2004. Um, so uh, factor analysis uh, it was actually first developed in the 1920s, around the same time as uh, ANOVA, um, and shortly after the t-test. Uh, so this stuff is not super old, and when... Um, Comrie first was studying it in the late 1940s. I mean, it was less than 30 years old, these methods. So he was at the forefront of developing them. Um, Charles Spearman and Raymond Cattell were uh, the uh, inventors. Dr. Cattell moved uh, from Harvard to University of Illinois in 1945. And shortly thereafter, uh, Comrie uh, got a job for a few years there uh, with uh, Cattell. Uh, the reasoning uh, back in, I don't want to go too far into the history, but some of this stuff is kind of funny. The reasoning why Dr. Cattell left Harvard for Illinois was in part because they were developing the first computer <laughs> uh, or the first electronic computer known as the ILLIAC-1. Very fancy, um, scary sounding computer, which made it possible for him to undertake large scale factor analyses. So, um, and so he was moving around the country, uh, and so was Comrie, to do, be able to do factor analysis. So why was this such a big deal to these guys? Why did, why has, what is factor analysis and why is it so important? Well, nobody knows. No, that's not true. Actually, um, both of these guys used factor analysis to identify different dimensions or factors underlying personality. They were personality researchers. And so the challenge at the time and what st uh, psychologists were studying um, at the time uh, a lot was uh, the um, uh, our ability to uh, separate different dimensions of personality into factors or into different um, subcategories of personality so that we could define people by their personality and uh, identify ways of helping those people as in therapy uh, 
uh, sessions to uh, help someone uh, who falls high on the neuroticism scale or something like this. Um, so personality studies have, are very, um, uh, have a long history in psychology as well. Um, and uh, probably a longer history than some other areas of psychology like uh, perhaps social psych or uh, certainly sports psychology. Uh, so anyway, uh, factor analysis has been useful for a long time, uh, dating back to about 100, almost 100 years now, I think. And so what it is, is if you haven't seen it, it's an ability or it's an, a technique uh, to uh, group uh, subsets of variables into factors. Um, and originally this was done, like I said, to um, sort of clump uh, different uh, characteristics together to form personality traits or to identify personality traits in people. Um, so uh, what's done here is uh, it's sort of a fancier version of uh, calculating a reliability for a scale. Um, so let's suppose you have a, a questionnaire of 10 items, and we'll see some examples here in a minute. Suppose you have a questionnaire of 10 items. You can test to see whether those 10 items will all go well together. And if they do, they'll have a high uh, alpha, for example, a reliability score. And then uh, with factor analysis, you can also confirm that, but you can also see if we should split that 10 item scale into five and five or six and four, depending on how well those items correlate with each other. And so the ideal is that we have factors that are uniquely defined such that fa uh, items within or variables within each factor correlated well together, but items um, outside that factor are not correlated as well together. So you're separating these uh, items or these variables into unique dimensions uh, statistically. For example, Comrie in 1970, grouped 40 questionnaire items into eight personality factors such as trust versus defensiveness, extroversion, introversion, uh, emotional stability, neuroticism, and so on. So this is what uh, he, there's a paper uh, that he wrote back then uh, using uh, some of these, um, at the time, innovative techniques to separate 40 questionnaire items into eight factors. And this was done through the data. This was not done by hypothesis testing, and so there was some controversy, I think, over the years for Comrie to endure because it was like, well, he didn't necessarily hypothesize that uh, extroversion, introversion was one of these uh, factors. In fact, he didn't set up the items necessarily even to measure them specifically. And then he just had a bunch of undergraduates fill this out. Um, maybe they were also non-undergraduates. I don't know, maybe some adults or other populations filled this out too. I'd have to go back to the study to find out who actually took the scale, but took the, the questionnaire. But based on on their data, then he, okay, he saw there's six items, let's say, for extroversion, introversion, but he didn't see them as extroversion, introversion in advance. He just saw the six items after they, the data was suggesting that, hey, they should co they correlate. These six items correlate well together. They should be in a unique factor. And then he went in based on what the items were and was like, hmm, what do these six items represent? Oh, I see that they seem to uh, assess extroversion or introversion in some form, each of them. And so he, he named the, the factors based on this sort of backwards process of letting the data uh, tell him uh, what the patterns were. So uh, in my dissertation uh, I and, and subsequent studies, I've used this um, competitive state anxiety scale, um, which has three dimensions typically, uh, and 17 items uh, grouped into uh, three categories, somatic anxiety, cognitive anxiety, self-confidence. So I've actually run some of the same uh, analyses that Comrie did uh, 50, almost 50 years ago. Um, so uh, for the competitive state anxiety inventory, this is just an example to work from for us for today. Uh, the scale of one to four, each item uh, falls on a not at all to very much so scale. Um, and it's designed to measure anxiety before or during a competitive event. Um, which could be a sports competition for my purposes, or it could be a public speech or some other um, stressful, uh, anxiety-provoking event, or it could be positive. It could be a, an exciting event, as in some of these sports championships um, that we look at in our research. But enough about my research. Uh, so this is your first factor. We've got some numbers in here, uh, which we will be explaining through the course of this video. Um, the somatic anxiety, for example, I feel jittery or tense. Um, the cognitive anxiety items are uh, concern or worry, uh, cognitive concern about um, uh, competition, that the, either the upcoming or current competition. And the self-confidence is the opposite. This is going to then be a positive version of those negative anxiety um, uh, scales. This one is I feel self-confident or I feel 
uh, confident that I can meet the challenge. So where do we get all these crazy numbers? Well, they're not crazy. They're just a little bit um, uh, hard to explain if you just look at them and don't do the factor analysis and try to interpret from there. So the, the point of this video is to get to the point where we don't think they're so crazy after all. Um, and we actually understand a little bit about where they uh, come from. So uh, the um, factor loading is the term for those uh, numbers on connecting the overall factor to the individual items. So that 0.66 we'll see uh, is a connection between item 3 and uh, the factor and can be interpreted as a correlation. So it would be a correlation or a relate strength of the relationship between uh, the self-confidence overall factor and that particular item. And the higher the factor loading, the better the item goes with the factor, or the better the item represents the factor. And then you have these leftover variances on the end. These are, uh, that's all the variance that is not uh, explained by the overall factor, the variance in the overall, uh, the variance in the specific item that is not explained by the overall factor. So if the overall factor is representing the item very well, the factor loading is going to be high, and the leftover variance typically is going to be low. So uh, there's two approaches here. I, I did a confirmatory factor analysis. This is when you go in with a hypothesis um, already. So you're like, okay, I've seen a previous study. In this case, I saw a previous study that already called self-confidence uh, these five items. And so I can then hypothesize in advance that that's what's going to happen, that self-confidence will be those five items, and then I can go and run my analysis with that expectation. Uh, this is what I did, and this is this is the foundation for your, many of you guys are going to take structural equation modeling, Psych 534 as your next class. Latent variable uh, creation is basically just the creation of these factors based on uh, hypotheses that you make in advance, and then um, uh, you try to confirm what, based on the data what your expectations are. Well. Comrie would argue that that's a little bit presumptuous, especially when you're developing a scale that's new. Um, if you're developing a scale that's new, Comrie would say, well, you need to make sure that you um, uh, define your factors in a way that the data is suggesting should be uh, um, done and not let uh, hypotheses bias you. So there's two different approaches here. You do not go in with a bias uh, or a hypothesis. However, if you say it, you do not go in with a bias. It sounds like a good thing, right? If you do not go in with a hypothesis, it sounds like a, like a crazy thing, like you're not following the scientific method. So there's different ways that exploratory factor analysis has been conceptualized over the years. Um, Dr. Comrie was a big fan of uh, exploratory factor analysis because, like I said, you, you, like he said, uh, used to say, you don't want to bias yourself. You don't want to go in with a 40-item questionnaire and presume that certain items will correlate with each other until you see the data and realize what people are actually thinking about these items. And then, only then, can you define, let's say, extroversion, introversion, and something, or something like that, a de uh, dimension of personality or some other psychological assessment. Uh, but then again, if you don't follow the scientific method and you don't go in with a hypothesis, uh, then others will be uh, skeptical. And so uh, statisticians and psychologists have debated confirmatory versus exploratory factor analysis passionately over the years. I am not one of those who is so passionate about um, only using one or the other. I think they're both. Uh, uh, I, I use confirmatory factor analysis if I have an expectation, if there is a prior hypothesis or if there is a prior research study that has done this uh, factor analysis on a scale, um, then I use the confirmatory approach. If this is a new scale uh, that needs to still be uh, sort of fleshed out in terms of what it's measuring, then I go with the exploratory analysis. And so we're going to cover exploratory analysis uh, today, today uh, in this video, uh, whenever you're watching this. Uh, if you watch this tomorrow, it could be tomorrow. That doesn't make sense. Anyway, um, we're going to cover exploratory factor analysis in this video, um, and then we're going to leave confirmatory factor analysis, its very close cousin, to future uh, classes because that's going to be the foundation, like I said, for structural equation models, which is what uh, Psych 534 covers. So if you're more, if you're curious about confirmatory factor analysis and you can't wait, um, let me know and we can go through some of the literature on that and I can give you a preview of, of uh, Psych 534 or if you're not going to take that class, we can talk more about it. All right, so to keep the things relatively simple, we're going to start with the correlation matrix, um, cutting the 17 anxiety items down to 9. And so here's your correlation matrix. I excluded item 9. Um, as well, so like this is a little, I'm trying to keep this 
real. <laughs> so this is items one through eight and item 10. It's not a miscount. It's just that I excluded item nine. Uh, okay, so here's your correlation matrix. You could print this out, and we will print this out in SPSS um, uh, to get our, uh, is the foundation of our factor analysis. Now, the first step here, I've got some uh, items highlighted. I'm highlighting any um, correlation that falls above 0.3. This is not a, a rule by any means, but it's just a, an initial look, an initial uh, guideline for how to start picking out which items go well together and which items don't go well together. So if you look, for example, at the bottom row, uh, item 10, you see that item 10 correlates well with item 3, and it also correlates well with item 7, but it does not correlate well, or at least not above 0.3 in magnitude, with any of the other items. So you could start to think, okay, maybe there's going to be a factor here. Maybe items 3, 7, and 10 are going to go well together. Okay, so that's a, that's a maybe, though. We're not officially defining it as, as such. Um, if we were to look at item 3, we could look at uh, item 3 going across and then down. So you see there's an item 3 row. You could go across that row and then go down the item 3 column. And you see only two highlighted values again, uh, none in the row and only two in the column. And it's item 7, sure enough, and item 10. So it looks like that trio might be forming a, a factor. Uh, when you look at item 1, however, just going down the first column, you see that it correlates well with 2, 4, 6, and 8. So, I mean, that might be a larger factor that may emerge. Um, or you might just uh, have to wait and see on item 1. And, and generally, when you look at this correlation matrix, you don't have to look at it for long. In fact, uh, some researchers, eager researchers, might just skip right past it. Um, and that's because the factor analysis is going to tell us what to do. Uh, it's going to guide us through, uh, but it's it's generally stopped and, and paused at this point because I um, I wanted to give you a sense for what the factor analysis is um, is doing. It's looking for these common uh, um, these these patterns of correlations, and it's going to transform this correlation matrix to allow us to interpret with more precision. Okay, so uh, how do we decide for sure how many factors there are? How uh, and then how do we decide which variables go with which factors? And how do we decide if maybe even a, fa a variable goes with more than one factor? Well, it all starts with eigenvalues. So what is an eigenvalue? I've got my appendix A here sitting in front of me. You guys can't see it, but maybe you can hear the book. I just opened it. OK, uh, to page 933. This is my um, using multivariate statistics book, sixth edition. Um, so on page, pages 9.33 to 9.36, you've got um, an explanation of what eigenvalues and eigenvectors are, and also a reference to Tatsuoka 1971, um, which is a, uh, as they say, round up that article, get the cat off your favorite chair, and prepare for an intelligible, if somewhat lengthy, description of the same subject. So at this point, there's, this is the point in factor analysis studies where there's a split. I, Andrew Comrie took us through um, in great detail what an eigenvalue and an eigenvector were, even though I don't really remember how he did it because it's been a while. Um, but he, he took us through this in great detail. Um, if you are intellectually, statistically curious, uh, you should definitely go through um, Appendix A in this section because um, there is more to it. And you will, by the end of the um, section, as Tabashik and Vidal say, uh, a little more appreciation for your computer, please, next time you use it because they demonstrate the algebraic way to get eigenvalues uh, and eigenvectors uh, extracted from a correlation matrix. Um, so, uh, but if you're not so curious, that's okay too. Um, we're just gonna fly through this part. And so the, the notes, um, they, they, if, they, if my notes stand alone in this section, they're not doing enough for you really to uh, capture what eigenvalues and eigenvectors are. Um, but in a nutshell, uh, and that, that's okay by the way, because we, um, we can move forward and interpret um, and, and again, this is a psychology class, so we're not going to stay with this too long um, unless you are so, so curious um, as to go into the appendix. But um, generally, as the appendix uh, clarifies, um, what we're trying to do here is we're trying to consolidate our correlation matrix into, um, as it says here, uh, the trying to consolidate the variance. And if we consolidate the variance, we're what we're doing is we're taking a correlation matrix that looks like this, and we're trying to capture the variance of these values in one or a set of, of values that allow us to say, okay, there's one factor. 
okay, there's not one factor, there's actually two factors. Maybe there's three factors. Um, and those factors then capture the variance um, in that uh, matrix and do it in a way that allows us to match the variance of those factors or the eigenvalues of those factors uh, with particular variables. Um, so, but what is said here, calculation of these uh, eigenvalues and eigenvectors is difficult and not particularly enlightening. So, if it's not particularly enlightening, you should look into it if you're curious, but we're not going to go through it because then by the end we'll be like, well, that wasn't very interesting. So, the meaning behind these, though, is tied up, like I said, in the variance. And any matrix can tra uh, be transformed, any correlation matrix in this case, uh, can be transformed to get eigenvalues and corresponding eigenvectors. And so we'll allow the computer to do that for us, and we will interpret uh, appropriately. And then we will scratch our heads and be like, what, what is an eigenvalue again? And then we'll go back to Appendix A as, as we wish, or Tatsuoka 1971, uh, to really get the depth behind it. Um, but in, in any matrix, I think um, you can think of this also as a transformation. Uh, you're taking uh, a correlation matrix and you're transforming it to derive meaning from it. And so you can take those rows and columns and do any, anything you want algebraically with it. Um, and when you take the, the matrix and transform it, you just have to make sure that the new matrix that you get in the end is uh, algebraically... Uh, a, a direct transformation of the original matrix. Um, so you can't just change value, go in and change values arbitrarily. You have to do it algebraically. Um, but besides that, we're going to just see eigenvalues and a, a list of, of them um, to inform our factor analysis. So, uh, so there's some rules of thumb here, and I'm going to pause and go to the SPSS file, and we're going to keep these rules of thumb in mind. All right, so here's the uh, practice data set here for you. Uh, in SPSS, you've got uh, this is the CSAI, which is the Competitive State Anxiety Inventory, uh, the nine items uh, that I have included here. Um, and it's going to be, this is actual data for my dissertation, so it's like 243 people. Some of them have missing data. All right, so the first step here is to go to Analyze, Correlate, and Bivariate. This is, this is going to allow you to get the correlation matrix for all nine variables. And so I've, you'll see them on the left here. I'm going to move them over to the right and just click through. And this is not generally to be interpreted. This is gonna match what you have in your notes, but the one thing that you should note here um, is like if there's no correlations above 0.3 anywhere, or let's say you go across CSAI8 and you're like, man, CSAI8 doesn't have any correlations with any uh, other variables. Like maybe we should just kick that item out because it's not, it doesn't seem to be going well with anything. You see that maybe if you accidentally include an item from a different scale uh, in there or something like that, you might be like, oh, I need to kick that one out. Oops, yeah, that's right. But all you're really uh, looking for here is uh, if there's any correlation above 0.3 anywhere in the matrix, then you're probably good to go and you're authorized to run a factor analysis. All right, so moving on to the actual factor analysis, we're going to go to Analyze and we're going to go to Dimension Reduction and Factor. And again, we're going to move all 10 of our variables over to the right. And this is just an initial look at extracting variables, as is said here. Um, so we're not going to rotate. We're not going to so There's different uh, options to select here. We're going to keep it relatively simple at first. Uh, we're just going to go to Extraction and uh, select Scree Plot. And this is going to allow us to uh, evaluate an uh, initial look at how many factors we should, uh, we should have in our, our data. So we're going to click through, click OK. And we're going to get a couple of things here, and we're going to look at our rules of thumb and compare. So uh, the first thing that I generally look at here is the uh, total variance explained table. Um, and the rule of thumb is if a factor's eigenvalue is greater than one, then you should keep that factor. So uh, factors here are labeled as components along the left side. So the number one, that's your number one factor, and that is a 3.446 eigenvalue. 3.446 is in the total column. So we're going to keep at least one factor. Then we go down to the second one, 1 1.976. Okay, that's also above one. We're going to keep at least two factors. Then we go down to the third one, 0.841. Now that one is, it's on the border. It's not one, but it's not too far from one. So that I would call that a maybe uh, for now. And, and one thing that, that I learned uh, from Comrie was that this is, again, we're not operating with a hypothesis. So this is exploratory by nature. And so 
the decision is really up to the researcher. Uh, it's it's not a, quite as scientific as your typical hypothesis testing scientific method procedure. Um, and so as long as you include some justification for your decisions that you make uh, along the way that makes sense based on what factor analysts have done in the past, um, then you're going to be okay typically. Um, so with that third factor then we're going to say no for now, but we're going to keep it in mind. Um, we're going to go to rule of thumb number two. This is the Scree test developed by Cattell. Um, and this is the plot that we, we selected, uh, Scree plot. So I'm going to look at this over on the left side here. And this, the word Scree comes from um, like geology. Uh, it's an odd term, but um, this is a plot of factors on the x-axis. So no, component number uh, is, is the label in SPSS. Uh, goes all the way up to nine. Um, these are a plot of factors or potential factors that could be declared uh, as part of your uh, uh, solution. And then eigenvalues along the y-axis. So you see those first two factors are above uh, one. The, th the second or the third factor that is at 0.841 is slightly below one. And what you look for here is the point where the line where a line drawn through the points changes slope. And so there's a pretty clear change in slope, right? You go from that first uh, point over here on the left side, uh, and then you go down, there's not a lot of change in slope at, at the second factor here, but at the third factor, there's a pretty distinct change of slope. And so that's where, that's where you draw the line. You draw the line right at that change. And the biggest change for this particular graph is at that third factor. So what that means is that that third factor is the decision point. You either keep it or you don't based on the content of it. And so you have to kind of look into it a little bit more. What is that third factor? Which items are, are loading onto that third factor? And based on which ones are loading, you, you look, you see if it makes sense. Do those three items and content match each other? And if they do, you keep it. If you don't, if they don't, then you don't keep it. Um, so <laughs> this is the, the origin of the uh, scree plot um, terminology here. This is, for, like I said, from geology. The, it's like a, uh, the side of the mountain is the graph, and the scree refers to the debris, debris fallen from a mountain lying at its base. I've seen some scree, I think, when I visited Yosemite before. Uh, so the scree test says to stop the analysis at the point where the mountain ends, and that's where the, um, the uh, third factor for us uh, exists. So it looks like we have two factors for sure, and maybe a third factor. And like I said, deciding about that third factor is based on more than just a, a, like a, a blind rule of eigenvalue greater than one, for example. Um, it, it's more based on what the contents of that third factor are and a little bit of thought about whether it makes sense. So we've uh, accomplished for our, our uh, example data set here, uh, step number one, which is based on the rules of thumb, specify number of factors. We're going to say three for now, but maybe only two, depending on the process. Uh, then we're going to go and find the loadings of each variable on each factor. That's going to guide us. And then we're going to rotate that solution so that it can be interpreted. So. I'll explain what that means, and then we're going to decide ultimately how many factors to keep, and if necessary, go back and redo it. Like if you keep three, let's say, and it doesn't make sense, then you have to do it, and then stop, and then go back and keep two only, and redo the analysis. That's that's the uh, the process of, of factor analysis, uh, exploratory factor analysis. So we're saying three factors for now. Usually, and this is not Comrie's rule. This is like my rule from my experience. So it's anything but a rule, really. It's just like, well, we don't know yet. We don't know about that third factor yet. So we might as well keep it because then, well, we can always redo the analysis again at the end. Um, so we'll say three for now. And the, um, the eigenvalues listed in SPSS were 3.45, uh, 1.98, and 0 0.84. So, um, so this would give you like eigenvectors. What an eigenvector is, is a column of numbers. It's a uh, vector in this case is not like a vector. You might think of like something in uh, geometry or something like that. Um, there is a geometric way to conceive of these things, but uh, we can only, we'll, we'll only get into that by request. Uh, if you want to look at some of the geometric literature and factor analysis, there is some. Uh, but in this case, we have uh, an eigenvector is just a column of numbers. It's a, uh, in this case, a, a reduced version of your correlation matrix, where instead of nine by nine uh, for nine variables, now you have uh, three by nine factor by variable matrix. Um, and so if we're gonna get into the math, which we're not really, but if we wanted to review Appendix A and 
have lots of fun conceptualizing this. We'd have a matrix of eigenvectors, again, nine rows by three columns now. And the eigenvalues would be loaded into the diagonal of, an, of a matrix called L. I'm not sure why it's called L, but anyway, uh, it's a matrix of eigenvalues with the eigenvalues along the diagonal there uh, for those chosen factors, and then zeros uh, everywhere else. Um, so this is the math behind where a factor loading comes from. Ultimately, a factor loading is just simply a correlation between a factor and its individual item. Um, but then that factor doesn't actually exist in your data set, right? It's a concept. The factor is like three, let's say in this case, a three item concept that doesn't actually appear in your data set. And so how do you do a correlation between a concept and an actual variable? Um, well, this is the process. You get your eigenvalues and you get your eigenvectors by an algebraic transformation of your original correlation matrix. And then you multiply your matrix of eigenvectors by uh, a um, square root of the matrix of eigenvalues, that is the eigenvalues on the diagonal and the zeros everywhere else. And that gives you your factor loading matrix. Um, so uh, we did this. We, we did the multiplication even of the matrices by hand. If you, we're not going to do that in this class. I'm just showing off that I once did this in the past. <laughs> I don't know if that's showing off or letting you guys know that I was tortured. But anyway, um, uh, for you guys, you're just going to, again, rely on the computer to get this. Um, the other thing about my class was that it was a full a quarter at UCLA, 10 weeks of nonstop factor analysis. So uh, for you guys, I'm only giving you a couple of weeks of this. And so we need to kind of move it along. Um, uh, so, um, anyway, like I keep saying, at any point, if you're curious, if you want, if you're intellectually, like, not satisfied, let me know and we can talk more. Um, but here's your uh, matrix of factor loadings. Um, and the A matrix, that's a bold A in the literature, in the, in the textbooks, it's, these, are, these matrices are in bold. Um, uh, the factor loadings are like so. So factor one, which we still haven't yet defined, um, in terms of the concept, the content of what it is. Uh, factor 1 is characterized by these factor loadings or correlations with each item uh, listed out like so. And you can see as you go across that factor 1 has more strong correlations with each item than factor 2 does, and in turn factor 2 has more strong correlations than factor 3. So again, this is based on our choice of three factors, based on those eigenvalues that SPSS gave us. Um, and we, we skipped past interpreting the individual factor loadings because we need to do one more thing before we interpret them, and that is rotate uh, those loadings. So we're going to get to that, like I said, like I keep saying, we're going to get to rotation in a minute. Um, but this is a correlation between a factor and a variable. It's um, also a unique contribution, you could say, uh, of a variable or of a factor to a variable's variance. So, um, so there's two, two different textbook definitions of what a load factor loading is. So we only selected three factors here. If we had left in all nine factors, then we would have then like did a, done a, gone in a circle. We would have transformed our matrix, done this multiplication, and then got our original matrix back again. So that it's an illustration of, without doing all the algebra for it, it's an illustration of how A, the matrix of factor loadings, is just a repackaged or re um, or transformed version of the original correlation matrix. And so again, all this comes from that original correlation matrix, and we're just doing algebraic things to it to allow us to uh, uh, interpret it and derive factors from it. Pretty cool, right? Well, maybe. I don't know. So this is your uh, fundamental equation for factor analysis. Uh, we have the matrix represented here. I just got tired of, I don't know, putting matrix notation in here without at least one reference to the, the matrix movie. So imagine when you're doing these calculations and you're seeing these matrices pop up in SPSS that you are uh, also waving your hands around wildly as if you're in the movie. Uh, I, I don't know. Is that what they do? They wave their hands around wildly? Anyway, your fundamental equation for factor analysis is in the textbooks and it's uh, like so where R represents the original correlation matrix and A is the um, uh, matrix of factor loadings, and then A prime is the transpose of that matrix. A transpose, by the way, if you haven't uh, uh, been studying Appendix A uh, uh, very closely as we've gone along here, the transpose of a matrix is um, the, it's basically turning the matrix on its side. So you're taking the rows and putting them into the columns, and then you're taking the columns and putting them into the rows. Uh, 
And what that does is if you multiply a matrix by its transpose, it's sort of like squaring the matrix. Um, it allows you to square a matrix um, uh, in uh, matrix multiplication form. The other thing you can review here is matrix multiplication and how to um, go through that. But we're not requiring that yet, and my philosophy on matrix algebra is to only cover it as necessary. Uh, so, so far, some of these details have not been necessary. Um, except conceptually to set this up. All right, so we've got our uh, uh, fundamental equation and we've got our ways of uh, uh, extracting meaning from the uh, correlation matrix here. Um, and I've given you the fundamental equation. So now we, we move on to uh, these different ways that you can sort of tweak the process a little bit. It reminds me of like, okay, people invented factor analysis, people invented like uh, Windows or uh, um, uh, Apple computer, um, a modern Apple computer, and then they're like, all right, cool. And then people are like, wait a minute. Okay, I just got my new like laptop. Let me mess with the background and the colors and the put the icons over here on the left. No, I'm going to switch them back over to the right. Let me see what works the best for me. It's like you, you've got basically everything you need, but then you're kind of like people, the people are factor analysts over the years are like, well, what about this way to do it? Oh, what about that way to do it? Oh, this is slightly better for me. Oh, this makes more sense in this situation. And there's these subtle ways that you can um, tweak the process uh, to get results that may slightly better match your uh, situation, your data, uh, your hypotheses, and so on. Um, so the <laughs> principal components analysis is the least uh, I guess uh, the, the, uh, it's the default in SPSS, and it's the least realistic in some ways. Um, and the way that it's least, least realistic is generally, uh, it's, the way that it's unrealistic is generally not that big a problem. Uh, so you can still typically use principal components analysis, and you're doing fine. And the only reason not to is because, well, you're just trying to be a little bit more fine with your uh, settings, uh, so to speak, in the factor analysis. And so I'll show you what that means. Um, so for this PCA or principal components analysis, each, each factor is assumed to be a linear combination of variables. So what that means is like, okay, we have uh, a factor that is composed of three variables. That um, three variable combination is, it could be like an average of the three, right? If you take an average of the three, then that average is a linear combination of the three variables, right? Because you're just dividing each one by three um, and then adding them up. Or you could do, let's say theoretically, you could do 0.5 times... Um, the first item plus 0.25 times the second item plus 0.25 times the third item. That way the first item is weighed more, but either way, those weights add up to one, and so then if they add up to one, then they are, again, a linear combination, or the factor is a linear combination of the variable. So uh, a PCA is either just a, an average uh, of the uh, different components, or it's a weighted average. Um, and typically for when you do this as part of SPSS factor analysis, um, then it's a weighted average. So you see your correlation matrix here. Uh, th these are uh, assuming you're assuming with PCA that with the linear combination here that there are ones in the diagonal, and so with that item one's uh, correlation with itself is one. Item two correlation with itself is one, and that's again the default in SPSS, and that's what's uh, also printed in your correlation matrix. So to to assume this is um, to assume that the factors in the solution account for all of the variance in the variables. So like the factor self-confidence is exactly composed of the three items. And there's nothing else out there that you could possibly measure in the world that is self-confidence that is not captured by those three items, if that makes sense. So um, so it's, it's presumptuous. It's a little bit simplified from reality because, well, I'm a really good uh, professor, but I'm not really that good at being able to make perfect factors. Um, or anyone else, not even Andrew Comrie. Uh, so there's these ways of reducing. So like, okay, you're like, I'm gonna just, I'm gonna be able to capture about 80% of the measurement of confidence, or I'm gonna, I'm gonna capture 70% of the measure of anxiety, right, with my three items. And I'm gonna acknowledge that there's also 30% of measurement of anxiety, let's say, that is also unmeasured and out there in the world still to be measured. And so that's more realistic. And so. We're going to replace the ones in the diagonal, which represent perfect, um, perfect measurement, uh, uh, theoretically perfect measurement, with something less than one, so that we're being more realistic. Um, and statisticians, Andrew Comrie, Raymond Cattell, all these factor, anal factor analysts over the years have debated and debated this. And uh, Comrie, this was another thing where he had strong opinions 
um, and I, I don't, uh, but <laughs> it's interesting to run through these, and that's really what, all we're going to do is just run through them, talk a little bit about the theory of each one, um, and why maybe it's different, and then look at the results, and in this case with, this, with the anxiety data, you're going to see that the results, um, regardless of which extraction method we pick, are going to be similar. So uh, if your data generally is well behaved, like no, no super outliers, no uh, wildly not normal uh, variables in your data set, you're going to see that these uh, extraction methods kind of converge on each other and are all pretty similar. So the first one uses communalities instead of ones in the diagonal of the correlation matrix. Um, so what a communality is, it's, is it starts with a squared multiple correlation or an R squared for each variable. So what is that? Well, you, let's say you have nine variables as we do here. You have, let's say, uh, item number four. You could actually make a, a regression, right, and have item number four be the DV and the other eight uh, variables be the IVs, and then you get an R squared for that equation. Well, that's the R squared that we're talking about. It's the percent of variance in that one item that is accounted for by the other eight items. And so that's the first sort of substitute for... Uh, what we were talking about before, which is like perfect measurement, right? What we're saying there is that that item, let's say item number four, the, the R squared is not going to be 100%, right? It's going to be something less than 100%. So we're saying that item four is accounted for by the other variables at a certain percentage, and that percentage is then what we're going to feed into the factor analysis. So we're allowing our factors to represent um, the actual overlap or the amount of variance accounted for uh, in each variable by the other variables in the data set. So what a communality is, is that, and then it's an iterated solution until a final solution is reached. So you can imagine there's a lot of overlap here in our R squared values. You have like uh, an R squared of 65% for a certain item and then 37% for the next item and so on. But then there's a lot of overlap because the IV becomes the DV for the next one and then the IV becomes a, a DV for the next one. And so that's a sort of a um, introduction level explanation for why this um, solution iterates because you have to uh, account for that overlap uh, in your different uh, independent variables becoming dependent variables when you're calculating these R squareds and so on. Uh, and it, this is another point in the video where I'm like, well, there's more to what a communality is, but that's a topic for another class where we have more than a couple weeks to cover factor analysis and, and we can also look up what Tabachnik and Fidel have to say about the definition of communality and uh, so on in the meantime. If you guys want more info, just let me know. All right, so based on this communality that we're going to generate in SPSS, we see that our ones in the diagonal have now switched and now we have uh, 0.56 for item one. That means that um, item one is being accounted for or uh, the other variables, I should say, the other eight variables in the data set are accounting for 56% of the variance in item one, um, and so on. And so uh, item one is overlapping a lot with the other variables compared to item two, which is only uh, 0.39. So then we take these communalities and then we plug them in instead of ones, and then all the math changes because, maybe not dramatically, but it changes because when we then transform this matrix to uh, get our eigenvalues and eigenvectors, uh, those numbers are different, and so then the eigenvalues and eigenvectors uh, likewise are going to be different. So we get those, then we do a similar factor analysis, uh, we get our factor loadings, and here is our uh, factor loading matrix for a principal components analysis. Um, so similar, you can go back in your video or in your notes to compare this to the uh, factor loadings uh, that were extracted before, and you're seeing not uh, much change. Um, so this is, this is for again, for a principal axis factor extraction. This is using communalities here. Um, so we're comparing this, let's say, to what we did initially. What we did initially was principal components analysis. Now we're looking at principal axis uh, factor analysis and so on with the next couple. So here, this is maximum likelihood factor extraction. This is what I used uh, or have used in my research uh, most often. Um, and this is based, again, we, we talked about maximum likelihood in the logistic regression video uh, as another concept that is, um, uh, it's, it's sort of, uh, what's the word, ubiquitous or something. It just keeps coming back in, uh, in different statistical methods. You're matching data to a model. In this case, the model is the factor model or the number of factors that you're trying to extract. So you're extracting, let's say, three factors, and then 
um, what maximum likelihood is doing here is it's matching what you have in the data to that three-factor model and trying to see if there is um, you're, you're maximizing the likelihood of it. You're trying to compare and see if, if this is an, indeed a good factor model. Um, so uh, by definition here, you're calculating factor loadings that have, or you're letting SPSS calculate factor loadings that have the best probability of yielding a sample with the observed R matrix. That's your data. Um, and like I said, I've used this one most often because, um, and now this, uh, um, this research article is a little bit older, but this was... Um, uh, the former director of the Thurstone Psychometric Lab and his authors, um, uh, Dr. McCallum, who I met briefly at a conference once, I said, hi. He said, hi, and that was it. That was the extent of our conversation. Anyway, um, he, his article, uh, 2003, recommended maximum likelihood factor extraction based on hours and hours of um, searches through literature over, over history, um, looking at... Uh, uh, comparing these different um, factor extraction models. Now, it's been a few years since this um, study came out, so maybe there's some new literature if you guys uh, find, if you're nerdy enough to go through the um, psychometrics literature and find something that um, is, no, uh, is, is more recommended now, let me know. Um, but meanwhile, um, we run this in SPSS, we select maximum likelihood, and we get a, a factor loading matrix that, again, does not change much, um, but... Uh, is, is based on this idea uh, that um, you're matching your data to your model, uh, which is a little bit different philosophy than the others. Okay, so the last uh, uh, extraction method I was going I want to talk about is the unweighted least squares uh, uh, factor extraction uh, method. This is um, a special case of principal axis, which is the first one. Um, you're ignoring values on the diagonal. Basically, this is this was um, this was Comrie's choice uh, back in in uh, when I was learning from him, and what he uh, he, he did, he wrote these iterate, it was an iterative process, and he, so he wrote like iteration one, and then he had a correlation matrix, and then he did iteration two, and he, he wrote that next uh, matrix, and it was an iterative process where you set up, let's say, a three-factor model as if we, as, as we've done here, and then you um, do some subtractions of that, of the uh, loadings that would be implied by that model compared to the actual data, and when you do those subtractions, least squares implies like a regression approach. So you're doing those subtractions of the model uh, uh, correlation, uh, subtracting the, um, the uh, data correlation, squaring it, and then you're trying to minimize those squared values. And so this was originally developed by Comrie, actually. Uh, in the literature, if you go all the way back to 1962, he called it the minimum residual method. I think it's just sort of morphed into the unweighted least squares uh, terminology. Um, so you sort of start without any communalities, and then as you're iterating uh, through these, these subtractions and squares, um, you are generating communalities. And so your final solution includes communalities, but the initial one does not. Um, so it's kind of like backwards from the principal axis uh, method in that way. And after all that, your factor loadings don't change too much. And again, they don't change too much. So... Uh, like, like I said, sometimes they will. Uh, sometimes this matters uh, more than other times. And in this case, the, the data set that I had was pretty well behaved. All the items were on a scale of 1 to 4, or all the responses were uh, to items on a scale of 1 to 4, so there wasn't a whole lot of it, uh, variation in um, the different variances of the different um, items, and so uh, that's what I mean by well behaved. Um, all right, so we made some progress here. We got to still have to rotate the solution, however. And really, you wouldn't have to do all that in real life. You would just select the maximum likelihood method as recommended by the authorities. Or uh, you could go ahead and do the principal um, axis, wh whatever you choose. Um, maybe you want to do unweighted least squares as a, as a tribute to Comrie. Um, either way, you choose one, um, and then you uh, get those loadings, and you still aren't interpreting. So we've made it all the way to this, this point. We're still not interpreting our factor loadings. So we need to rotate. So what does rotating mean? Well, you've got your factor loadings. Uh, as you may recall from those uh, loadings, you saw uh, factor one is like correlating well with every single item. So what we need to do is, is a second uh, transformation of this um, matrix. We've transformed first from the original correlation matrix to a matrix of factor loadings. And now we need to transform the matrix of factor loadings to a algebraically equivalent uh, matrix of factor loadings but one that is uh, more easily interpreted or um, uh, will better define our factors for us. And so the goal of this rotation, uh, you can imagine like you're taking a, um, 
uh, if you have non-normal data, let's say you can um, take a square root of that data set, or you can squ uh, you can um, square it if you want, or you can um, do these various uh, um, uh, transformations of your data. The the um, interpretation may get more difficult, but in this case, a transformation of your data makes the interpretation easier, as it were. And so this is uh, again, this is the guy that was the founder of the Thurstone Lab, uh, Dr. Thurstone himself, who came up with uh, factor rotation uh, back in the, I guess that would be the early 1900s. Um, and simple structure is the goal. Simple structure is what? Well, uh, it is uh, where each factor has several variables that define it, or are, are loading highly onto it, or have high factor loadings, but each variable only loads highly onto one factor. So what we're trying to do is separate our factors from each other into unique components. And sometimes when you rotate uh, these these variables, they load onto all the factors. And they call it cross-loading, where like a variable is like highly correlated with more, more than one factor. And so that's a, that's the first indication sometimes that your um, you need to reduce your number of factors because your uh, your factors are not being well defined here. A well defined factor has several variables that load highly onto it, and that those variables are unique to it as well. Okay, so this um, this happens, like I said, through a transformation of your matrix. It's another um, uh, algebraic process, and um, the uh, methods of factor rotation, you have a choice here. There's a fork in the road. You can either assume that factors are uncorrelated or you can assume that factors are indeed correlated. So with, a, with my model, I've got somatic anxiety and cognitive anxiety, for example. If you're feeling cognitive anxious, cognitively anxious, you are probably also feeling somatically anxious, right? So for me, it, it would make sense to do an oblique rotation because you're assuming that factors, while unique, are still going to be correlated a little bit. Uh, so, for example, if, if there's a somatic item like, I feel butterflies in my stomach or something like that, that's clearly a somatic item because it's a uh, it's something that you feel and is not necessarily generated by cognition. Um, but then again, if you're feeling cognitive anxi cognitively anxious, then you might, even though butterflies are not a cognitive symptom, you might still, uh, there might be a, still be a correlation there. So it's it, oblique rotation is a compromise. Yes, you're separating these items into distinct factors that are unique, but you're still allowing them to be correlated, and that's uh, often the more realistic um, way to go uh, with the oblique rotation. Uh, I think at the beginning of factor analysis, almost all um, uh, factor analyses were orthogonal, um, and so there's a long tradition of orthogonal rotations, meaning that factors are assumed to be uncorrelated. Um, but in the in the recent literature, it's um, it's become uh, clear, at, le at least in psychology, that oblique rotations are uh, usually the way to go because you can then allow your factors to correlate a little bit, and that's more realistic when you're dealing with psychological variables. Um, so I just gave you one argument for oblique rotations, but this has again been debated hotly over the years by nerdy statisticians and psychologists. Um, so. <laughs> If you're interested in that, you can. It's another thing to follow up on uh, if you uh, go back to the literature or to Google even. Um, so orthogonal rotations, like I said, have been popular, and we should definitely give them their time here. The Veramax rotation is probably the most popular one still in the literature. Um, and what we're doing here is we're maximizing the variance of loadings um, uh, within factors and thus separating uh, items from each other. Uh, so, like, if you have a high loading, a 0.7, and then you have another high, uh, and you have a low loading, a 0.3, you're trying to drive algebraically, not artificially, but algebraically, you're trying to drive that 0.7 higher, and you're trying to drive that 0.3 lower, such that if you drive the 0.3 lower for, let's say, item 6, then that 0.3 becomes 0.2, and item 6 is loading on a different factor, algebraically will then rotate around and come up. And so that's... That's the point of Veramax, is to try to uh, spread those those um, those loadings out a little bit, uh, so that we get a clearer picture of what we're doing and uh, uh, and uh, the factors that we're defining. So that's the Veramax rotation in a nutshell. Uh, the Quartermax and Equamax rotations are similar in that they are orthogonal. Uh, the Veramax rotation does this algebraically, like I said, by, and don't get scared, maybe maybe you're excited to see cosines and sines, um, it multiplies the factor loading matrix by the cosine of uh, 
what is that, the psi symbol? The cosine of psychology, I don't know. That, the, cos <laughs> the psi symbol in this case is the angle of rotation determined by the solution. So uh, like I said, there's some geometric interpretations of factor analysis too. Uh, this, this process uh, uh, will allow you to then push your higher loadings higher and your lower loadings lower in a way that uh, results in a matrix that is algebraically equivalent to the original um, and allows uh, you to further interpret your factor uh, analysis solution. Okay, types of oblique rotation. Um, direct oblomen is the one that's been most recommended, um, I think, in recent years. Uh, it allows for a wide range of correlations between factors. Um, so what this incorporates then, as you'll see, is a correlation matrix between factors. Uh, which is like zero for an orthogonal rotation, right? Because if you have an orthogonal rotation, the correlations between factors are fixed to zero. But if you have an oblique rotation, uh, you have to incorporate those um, correlations between factors. And so then the direct oblomen allows for larger correlations if they exist. Um, and I've seen this before where like somatic anxiety and cognitive anxiety correlate at like 0.7. But at that point, there's no cutoff value for what's too high, but at that point, if your factors are correlating too much with each other, then you probably want to think about consolidating them back into one factor. Uh, so th there's a there's a certain point where um, if you do an, an uh, oblique rotation, it's it's informative in another way because maybe it, it gives you another reason to then go back and um, reduce down your uh, factor analysis again. So. Direct oblomen is, the, is typically the choice. Direct cordomen we could read up on uh, in the literature. It's a special case of direct oblomen. Promax is there too. It always reminds me of a granola bar. There's like a Promax granola bar that you can get at the, at the convenience store. Yeah, that, that's, that's, that's the definition of Promax. Is it's just a granola bar. No, there, there's more to it than that. But again, we only have a certain amount of time here to cover factor analysis in 524 class, so we can move on. How do we decide? Well, this is Tabachnik and Fidel's advice. Orthogonal solutions offer ease of interpreting and describing and reporting results. So that's the one where the factors are unique and uncorrelated. Uh, yet they strain reality unless the researcher is convinced that the underlying processes are almost independent. In this case, for us, we have anxiety, somatic, and cognitive, and then we have self-confidence. The underlying process is, is, is anxiety uh, there, and so the um, somatic and cognitive and self-confidence uh, factors for us are going to be related and so we can go ahead and call them separate factors but we should do an oblique rotation uh, as is said here uh, so thus the researcher that's me is not convinced that underlying processes are almost independent so let's do that direct oblomen rotation and here's what it looks like so I need to pause and go back to SPSS and do all of this in SPSS uh, next Okay, so I've rewound a little bit here to uh, the point where we um, uh, covered the different extraction methods, and so I'm going to run through them real quick. We're going to show uh, show you what, what they look like um, uh, in SPSS. So we're going to go first with the principal axis factor extraction. So I'm going to go analyze dimension reduction and factor. Uh, all of the variables from before are are in there, and so here we to go to extraction. The default was principal components analysis, so I'm going to go ahead and switch that to principal axis factor extraction. You can see the, um, the options there. Uh, you, we don't really need the scree plot anymore since we already got it, so I'm going to uncheck that. Uh, and then I'm going to go fix number of factors three. And the reason I'm doing that is because we already determined that we had two factors and the third one is, is like a maybe. And so I'm, instead of doing it based on an eigenvalue greater than one rule, I'm going to fix it to three. Uh, and so I'm going to click continue. We're not going to rotate necessarily yet. Um, and so I'm just going to click OK, and we're going to see what it looks like. Um, there will be a list of communalities, first of all. And so uh, there's an initial communality, and then there's an extracted communality. The extracted communality is after the iterations uh, of the, um, uh, of the uh, R squared values, estimating a solution, and then iterating until a final solution is reached. So you can see there's a little bit of a difference there uh, in the SPSS output that should match this slide here. And then your factor loadings are down toward the bottom. So the factor matrix is down here at the bottom with three factors. Um, and you see the factors labeled one, two, and three across the top. And the items go down the side. OK, so uh, that is your principal axis extraction. Then we're going to move on to the maximum likelihood factor extraction. And 
all that takes is one simple switch here. So you're going to go to back to analyze dimension reduction and factor, back to extraction, back to the menu here, and maximum likelihood. Um, and you're going to leave fixed number of factors at three. And you're going to click through. Again, you don't have to do all of these every time, um, but you do need to select one and then know how to get there. So this is the, the process. Uh, again, you've got your factor matrix down here with the three factor solution, uh, which should match your notes here. Uh, and then we have unweighted least squares factor extraction. So we'll go through one more time and select this one in honor of uh, Andy Comrie. So we'll go back to extraction one more time and select uh, unweighted least squares and click continue and click OK. And we're going to get one more factor matrix here, which is your uh, unweighted least squares uh, factor matrix. So again, not huge differences here because our data is pretty well behaved. Um, so then we need to rotate. I'm going to go ahead and select a, um, a maximum likelihood extraction followed by an oblique rotation called called direct oblomen. And we're going to see our first uh, interpretable um, factor loading matrix. Okay, finally, here we go. How many minutes are we into this video? All right, so the extraction, I'm going to switch back to maximum likelihood. And then now we go to rotation. Rotation, the default is none. And so we need to switch that over to direct oblomen. You see some of the other options here. Direct oblomen is actually the only oblique one available uh, in uh, SPSS. You do have Veramax there and a couple other orthogonal ones. Um, so uh, we're just going to click continue, click OK, and we're going to get our rotated solution, uh, which is uh, the pattern matrix. So let me walk you through this a little bit before I interpret. So where are we? Here's your rotated loading or pattern matrix. It's called the pattern matrix in SPSS. And so what does this mean? Well, the rule of thumb is only variables with loadings of 0.32 or above should be interpreted. And where did that 0.32 come from, you ask? Well, there's a, a textbook uh, that was uh, composed by Andrew Comrie in the 1970s, uh, and it was co-written by Dr. Howard Lee, who was here at CSUN. So we do have some uh, factor analysis tradition here at CSUN. Howard Lee actually recently passed away. He was a professor here for a long time, and uh, when I first got here, he was still teaching as a uh, uh, as an adjunct, or uh, what's it called? Uh, they call it a FERPing professor. <laughs> FERP reply, uh, refers to someone who's retired but still comes back to teach a class. So anyway, Howard Lee was a very funny guy, had a great sense of humor. Um, not that Andrew Cromery did not have a great sense of humor, but well, Howard was more known for his humor than Cromery was. But anyway, moving on. Uh, so uh, the 0.32 or above um, uh, criteria comes from them and has sort of been accepted in the literature since then. Uh, in um, repeated factor analyses um, across various studies that have been done. If something is below 0.32, uh, then, or a loading is below 0.32, then that, that particular variable is not really loading meaningfully on to the factor. And so that's where that comes from. Um, and the meaning comes from repeated studies over the years. So it looks like we have three factors. Well, let's check this out. So here's the pattern matrix in SPSS. Uh, and here is the pattern matrix reproduced in the notes. So from this pattern matrix, we've got, well, factor one, let's look. We've got how many factor one items above 0.32? We've got item two, 0.57, item five, 0.82, and item eight, 0.46, and only those three items. So what happened when we rotated was that some of those other items for factor one used to be above 0.32, and then through this rotation, uh, which has the goal of driving the high loadings up and the low loadings down, we actually were successful in, in driving those low loadings down below 0.32 and thus allowing us to interpret a little bit better. So this is a good thing. Um, if you go to the highlighted matrix here, you've got your answers. And not only do you go down and see only three items per factor, but if you go across, perhaps more importantly, you see that each item is only loading at 0.32 or higher on one of the three factors. And so I, I kind of, I mean, I, this, I was kind of cheating because I knew that these three factors already were going to align this way with three items uh, correlating well with um, each factor uniquely. Um, but this confirms it. And so we can go ahead and move forward with our interpretation now, uh, going back to trying to figure out which items each, uh, like for example, for factor one, what was item two? What was item five? What was item eight? Uh, 
read through the content of those three items and then come up with a factor name that matches uh, the content of those three items. And so this is what Comrie was doing when he was trying to define extraversion, introversion, let's say, from six items that weren't necessarily designed to measure that, but then once he looked at them in, in collection with each other, in connection with each other, uh, he was able to conclude. So, um, uh, given this, we also have, uh, so we, we can do that, uh, we, we also have a, a correlation matrix uh, between factors, and this is, this is the unique thing about um, an oblique rotation. So, um, here's the factor correlation matrix. It goes here at, uh, at the bottom of the um, SPSS output, and what this does is it shows us that uh, factor 1 and factor 3 are highly correlated, uh, 0.65. And so I said, well, in real life, if you're at 0.7, let's say 0.8 uh, in a factor correlation, you might think about separating those factors out because they're just the same thing. Here, 0.65 is pretty high uh, as well. Uh, but we're going to treat it as separate for now, and the oblique rotation allows us to treat them as separate but also correlated at the same time, and then the reader can kind of judge as well. So that's a nice thing about an oblique rotation too. Factor 1, factor 2 correlate negative 0.29 and so on. Factor 2 and 3 at negative 0.11. So here's the write-up. And uh, I, like I said in the, um, in the, uh, a couple minutes ago, uh, when, you, when you find these loadings, you go back and you look at the items and you see what the content of the items were and then you match it to whatever concept or whatever uh, construct that you think you're, you're uh, measuring here with those, that combination of items. In this case, I, like I said, I cheated. I already knew this was going to happen, so I already knew items 2, 5, and 8 were cognitive anxiety items. I already knew that 1, 4, and 6 were somatic anxiety items and so on. So I'm kind of skipping that step for you uh, because it's, it's sort of prior knowledge that I have. Um, but you can see the factor loadings laid out like so. So you see, for example, uh, with item 1, the factor loading is 0 0.60 with factor 3, factor 3 being somatic anxiety and so on. Item 2, 0.57 factor loading with cognitive anxiety for whatever reason the arrows in these diagrams tend to point from the factor to the item and not vice versa. It's debatable. The direction there uh, could go both ways, actually. Uh, certainly going both ways, however, are the correlations between factors. So the 0.65, when you look at factor 1 with factor 3, that's actually cognitive and somatic anxiety, which makes sense. And then the self-confidence factor being negatively correlated also makes sense uh, in terms of its negative correlation with both of the other two. Now, for the... Um, Orthogonal rotation, you've got this, uh, it's a little bit simpler. So you, first of all, you don't have the uh, correlation between factors uh, and that, that um, uh, correlation matrix uh, between factors is zero, and so it doesn't exist. Um, we also have uh, something that's slightly simplified here, and that is that the matrix of factor loadings is the pattern matrix, and it's also the structure matrix. Well, what is the structure matrix, you ask? Well, it's it's nothing different than the pattern matrix for an orthogonal rotation. However, for an oblique rotation, the structure matrix and pattern matrix are unique and different. And the pattern matrix is still the one to interpret. So if you're looking at SPSS over here, you've got the pattern matrix. Those are your loadings. And then you've got the structure matrix below. Now, what the heck is this? Well, uh, the, <laughs> the structure matrix is the, the matrix of correlations between variables and factors. The Whereas, so that implies a loading, but in the case of an oblique rotation, the loading is now more exactly the unique contribution of a factor to a variable. So a loading is a little bit more like a, uh, a partial correlation, let's say, than a, a real correlation or a zero order correlation. So when we look at our loadings, we are then interpreting the A matrix, as it's called, or the pattern matrix, and we're reporting the structure matrix, but typically that matrix does not get interpreted. Um, so what happens here is you just, to be complete, you report the structure matrix uh, and you move forward. So here it is. No interpretation necessary. Okay, we're done. Well, there's one more thing to do, and that is to look at factor scores. Actually, there's many things that we could do. We could go into some of those rotations and extraction methods in more depth. We could go back and look more at eigenvalues and eigenvectors. I mean, there's many ways we could go into more depth on the factor analysis process, but uh, one more thing that I really should tell you about before calling it complete, and that is uh, factor scores. So factor sco So I mentioned earlier factor is actually an imaginary thing. Uh, you might have heard the term latent variable. Uh, latent is lat a latent variable is a factor, same thing. Um, so if something is latent, 
that means it's not actually, it doesn't actually exist, right? It's there, but it, you can't see it or touch it. Um, so, uh, so a factor is, is that thing. It's, it's, not, it's not in your data set. And so what happens is people, well, okay, maybe you define a factor. Maybe you define self-confidence, right? And you're like, well, what would a person score if that factor were to exist? Like, what would their response be? And so depending on your choice of factor extraction and rotation methods, you can actually generate estimates of what the scores would be if they had been measured directly. Uh, and those are your factor scores. So there's a way that SPSS will get this for you very easily. Um, and then, of course, once somebody came up with this idea of factor scores, people then started debating, oh, you should do it this way. No, you should do it that way. Uh, you're all wrong. You should do it this way. Uh, well, I'll just give you the most popular one for now, and that is a regression approach, which results in a distribution of scores for each factor that looks like a normal curve, a mean of zero and a standard deviation of either one for a principal components analysis or an R squared or SMC value for the other factor analyses. So it's, it's sort of like a, um, so, so if you're looking at this regression approach, right, you're thinking, well, okay, what are the uh, variables that go into this factor? Okay, let's, let's set up a, a regression then based on the factor loadings. So like the dependent variable is the factor and then the independent variables are the individual items that go into that factor. Then you weigh the individual items with their like uh, with their slopes by um, their factor loadings, and so then you can kind of come up with an estimate there. And then at the end of your estimate, you standardize something along those lines. So uh, I'm not testing you on the details of this. Um, like it's another thing we can look up on the side uh, in more depth. Um, but the result is a uh, standardized variable, one with a mean of zero, and then if we're Unless we're selecting principal components analysis, the standard deviation is not 1. It's actually like the R squared, which would be the, uh, let's say you have the, that, um, those three, three items uh, loading onto one factor. The uh, amount of variance that those three items account for in that factor is the standard deviation of the factor scores. Uh, and so once you uh, interpret, once you see these factor scores, you can interpret it, interpret them with these in mind. So for example, and I'll show you this in S SPSS, participant number three scored a 1.57 on factor one above the mean and pretty high, uh, negative 0.43 on factor two and so on. Um, so and their somatic anxiety score was also above the mean. So if they were high on anxiety, especially cognitive, and low on self-confidence, then participant number three in my, my data set here was pretty anxious. Um, you can conclude. And so um, let me show you these in SPSS. We've got uh, an option here. We're going to go back to where we were. I'm going to go to dimension reduction and factor. We're going to keep the uh, maximum likelihood selected. We're going to keep also the oblique uh, direct oblomen rotation selected. And we're going to go to scores. And then you're just going to select save as variables. And you're going to keep the regression um, default uh, method there. There's also a Bartlett and an Anderson Rubin. There were some statisticians over the years that came up with alternative ways of uh, uh, calculating factor scores, which uh, we could look into in our spare time because we that's what we do with our spare time, right? No, maybe not. Okay, so we rerun this and we're like, where are our factor scores? We didn't get anything. Well, they're actually in the data set. So you're going to go back to your data set and you're going to see three factor scores. We specified three factors, right? So for participant number one, you're going to see three factor scores here. For participant number two and so on. This was our anxious participant number three who scored high on um, so, uh, somatic and cognitive anxiety and low on confidence. So uh, for practical purposes at this point, uh, I'm just going to ask you to comment on whether these scores were above or below the mean. Um, you can also compare, let's say, the 1.57 to the 0.97 and say that the 1.57 was further uh, from the mean, and therefore that person was a little bit higher on that variable. But I'm not going to ask you to interpret based on the standard deviation um, because, well, it's uh, just not necessary at this point. And typically in research papers, uh, you're not going to see that level of depth uh, interpretation of factor scores. So for that participant number three, you're just going to go ahead and interpret above the mean on the first and the third factors and um, below the mean on the, on the second factor. Okay, so finally a couple of notes about factor analysis assumptions. This is the section that's like the, oh crap, we should have checked this before we started. 
Well, normal rules of thumb apply for um, normality checks. So you check for univariate, multivariate normality the same way as you would for a regression um, or a logistic, uh, for a multiple regression, logistic regression, any multivariate uh, analysis. Um, singularity and like extreme multicollinearity is also a problem here, although it's a different kind of problem. Um, so this is when like, let's say your first two items of your data set highly correlate with each other or are some linear combination of each other. Uh, suppose you're doing a factor analysis and you accidentally leave a uh, composite score in there, like a, an average of the first three items is in the factor analysis. SPSS is probably going to kick that uh, average out and be like, hey, uh, you know, don't do that. Don't include that one in there. That's singularity. Also, if, uh, and I mentioned this earlier, I think, in the video, if no uh, correlation at all exceeds uh, 0.30 in the uh, entire correlation matrix, then uh, maybe you want to consider doing something else uh, besides factor analysis because your variables are not related to each other. So this is your final rule of thumb, the one that knocks the whole thing out, and that is that uh, <laughs> it's recommended a sample. So this is from Comrie and Lee in their follow-up to their textbook. Recommending a sample size of at least 300 people. Oh no, grad students are like, oh man, I'm not going to be able to collect all those people before next spring to finish my thesis. Oh man. Well, the, uh, the footnote here that is the more practical side is that smaller samples are frequently sufficient, uh, especially when factor loadings are high. What that means is if factor loading, factors are well defined. Um, suppose you in particular have like a confirmatory factor analysis. You know that there's a particular scale that behaves well, that is defined in a certain way that's reliable, um, then definitely a smaller sample is okay. Um, my dissertation, I had like 243 people. You saw that data set uh, for this uh, video example. And I did a bunch of factor analyses on various scales and got it published ultimately. So, so I think on the practical side for factor analysis, factor analysis is, a, is just kind of like a fancier version of running reliabilities on your scales, right? It, if you have reliability Cronbach's alpha values for your scales um, and they're pretty generally high, then you're not going to get a lot of uh, skepticism from people from on your poster or on your uh, research paper um, because these things are, your scales are well defined. But um, in the case of exploratory factor analysis, you're oftentimes creating a new scale or exploring like, like the name says. So in that case, a reliability, a high reliability might not be enough. Maybe you need to do some more analysis on that scale before you define it. And of course, if you get through this lesson and you're like, oh, okay, factor analysis, this is cool stuff, and you, and you enjoy it, and you're, um, you're not uh, uh, deterred by the details of it, uh, then you should, you should always do it, it seems like uh, to me. Um, even if you have small samples, you can always throw in a factor analysis. I suppose if you have less than 30 people or something like this, very small uh, data set, then it's kind of inappropriate. But don't be scared off by this 300 or more uh, uh, estimate. Uh, you can still do factor analyses for smaller samples. They just might not carry quite as much um, uh, ability. You might not be able to replicate them quite as exactly in future samples. But all right, that's it.